All right, let's open up the word to Romans chapter 9 as we are going through uh, this wonderful, wonderful book. The first eight chapters have just been awesome. It has been great. And pretty much Paul has just been laying out um, foundations of Christianity, the truth, the reality. And what were those realities? We need to know that the whole world was under sin. That it didn't matter if you were a Jew or a Gentile. It didn't matter if you knew better or if you didn't know better. It didn't matter if you were trying to keep the law or not trying to keep the law. You were a sinner. All have sinned. All have fallen short of the glory of God. That means everyone in the entire world is pronounced as a sinner. Therefore, as a sinner, we are under the judgment. That's period. It does not matter what your pedigree is. You're a sinner. Therefore, you need a savior. And the gospel is shouting out to everyone and to all. All who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And he goes on to talk about the peace of God and the access to God we have through this grace that God has provided us through his son, Jesus. But you see, now as we go into chapter 9, we need to understand this section of scripture in context. Because Paul is going to be diving into the plans and purposes of God for this world. And there are some things that we need to know about God. And these words are omniscient, omnipotent. And you say, well, what do those words mean? It means God is all-powerful and God is all-knowing. You cannot wrap your mind around that statement. God is all-knowing. He knows everything. Even before he created the world, he knew what you were going to be doing. He knew all about you. He knew what you're going to be doing tomorrow, what you're going to be doing in five years from now. And that's just you. He knew all of people throughout all of creation and what the decisions that they were going to make. And he set his plan. He said what he was going to do. And he could see it all the way through. Therefore, God can speak of things before they even happen. Because God sees everything. And we need to know that about God. And the key is, is that we do not see the future. We don't know. We have no idea. And so, because this chapter is dealing with these types of issues, and I speak of election, what has happened is this section of scripture has become a chapter of developing two false doctrines. There are two false doctrines that are in the church and they use this section of scripture to back it up. Now, the Bible tells us that we need to rightly divide the word. And why it tells us that is the Bible cannot contradict itself. And if you think the Bible has a contradiction and you say, well, the Bible says his here and the Bible says something completely else there, so therefore the Bible contradicts itself, what that means is, is your interpretation is wrong. You need to reanalyze it because God's word does not contradict itself. And so we are going to be dealing with God's election and Israel. There is a doctrine out there, and this is the first one. It's called reform theology. The more derogative term, and, and a re reform theologist will not ever want to claim this term, but it's called replacement theology. And what replacement theology is, is that God is now done with the nation of Israel and that the church has now become Israel. And so all the promises in the Old Testament that are made to Israel as a nation are now for the church in a physical sense. And they label this or define this doctrine through this section of scripture. They're pointing to Romans 9 to make this case. And we're going to go through that. We're going to see why that's not true. And we, I will explain it as we go through. But that obviously is not true at all. The problem is when we read the Word of God is they will use the same word and it will describe two different events. For instance, Jesus talks about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, when you say that, you're speaking of two different kingdoms. You have to define what kingdom you're speaking of. Because, see, there's a spiritual kingdom that we're in now. The kingdom of God was within us. We, in our hearts, have the kingdom of God. But then there's also the kingdom of God that is future. And obviously, the, by the word, is a kingdom where God rules. And so by saying kingdom of God, you have to define what kingdom you're talking about. It's the same with when we talk about life. We all have life. But not necessarily. Only Christians have life. And so the Bible speaks of two different lives. The same it speaks of two different deaths. It speaks of a physical death and a spiritual death. 
And so we can have a hard time trying to understand Scripture because we think on just death always means the same thing in the Bible. So when the Bible says that if you continue in sin, you're going to die. We automatically think, well, you're going to die physically if you continue in sin. Well, even if you don't continue in sin, you're going to die physically. We all die. The Bible there is speaking of a, of a spiritual death. You're going to die if you continue in sin. You're going to die spiritually. You see what I'm saying here? This is key to understanding Israel and as we dive into this. Because Israel, the name means governed by God. It means God's people. Because you see, Jacob, his name wasn't Israel. His name was Jacob. And Jacob was very self-willed. He did his own thing. But finally, God broke his hip or dislocated his hip. And Jacob was humbled. And God says, Jacob, your name is no longer going to be called, in our words, heel catcher, <laughs> is the English translation of Jacob. But your name was going to be called Israel, governed by God. And it's key to understanding the meaning of that word because here we're going to get, be getting into spiritual Israel. And spiritual Israel is speaking of the church, the people of God. We are the spiritual Israel. We are God's people. We should be governed by God. But that does not negate the physical Israel. That there are two Israels. And not today, but in chapter 11, Paul's going to dive into that. There's the physical Israel the Jews today, and then there's the spiritual Israel, the church, those who are governed by God. And we have to get these right if we're going to understand the whole counsel of Scripture. Because God made promises to the nation as a people group, and all of a sudden they're like, well, they're not Christians, so therefore the promises have to be to the church. No, no, no. God doesn't lie. God sees everything. And we will see that as we go through. And so that's kind of the foundation here and now let's dive in chapter 9 verse 1 paul says i tell you the truth in christ this is a true statement he's saying i'm not lying my conscience also bearing me witness in the holy spirit that i have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart for i wish that i myself were accursed from christ for my brethren my countrymen according to the flesh who are the israelites Now, the nation of Israel, at Paul's day, the majority were not Christian. Remember, Paul was a Pharisee. Paul described himself as a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was very zealous for the law, but was Paul saved? Absolutely not. He thought he was serving God, but in fact, he was actually killing Christians. His goal was to kill Christians, and he thought he was doing God a favor. That was his mindset as a Jew. He was not saved. He was a heathen. Now here Paul is, after becoming a Christian, after realizing the truth, now he has a burden in his heart. And what is his burden? I want them to be saved. And I wish that even myself were accursed from, that's a big statement. I wish I was going to hell if it meant they would be saved. Wow. Because you see, even though the Jews believed in the Torah, the Old Testament, they did not know the true God. Now they called him God because realizing that God is not a name, God is a title. And so they said, we worship God, but they weren't worshiping the true God. In fact, remember when Jesus was talking to the Pharisees and they said, we're of our father Abraham. We worship the God, true God. And Jesus says, no, you're not. You're not worshiping the true God because if you were worshiping the true God, you would believe in me. Because you don't believe in me, you're not worshiping the true God. You're worshiping your father, the devil. Jesus accused the Jews of worship of the devil, the religious Jews. They were worshiping the devil. Now, we wouldn't see that like that. I mean, they're obeying the Old Testament law. They're going through their practices. But Jesus busted them and said, you, you guys aren't worshiping God. You're worshiping the devil. That's pretty heavy. Because you see, now this can be a little bit confusing to us because they were reading the Bible every single week. They had synagogue. And they would get together in synagogue and they would study the Bible. So we think, well, obviously they seem like people that love God. 
But guys, Jesus was the manifestation of God. Jesus said, when you see me, you see God. You see the Father. And they rejected Jesus. Therefore, they rejected the true and living God. The Jews didn't worship a God. It just wasn't the true God. They were very zealous for God, just not the right God. And it's not enough to be very zealous for God. It needs to be the right God. That's the key. Because the Jews as a majority back in this day were not worshiping the true God, they were not saved. Therefore, they were enemies of Jesus, enemies of the gospel. And Paul's going to talk about that as a people group. Right then, the majority of the Jews were not saved. And you know, guys, it's actually the same as today. The Jews as a majority are enemies of Jesus. They do not believe that Jesus was God, and they will deny any claim that Jesus said he was God. Jesus claimed to be God many times, and the Jews say Jesus never claimed to be God. They don't believe that he had, was God at all. Thus, they cannot know the true God. You guys, we have to understand this. As John writes, you cannot know the true God without acknowledging Jesus as God. You have to have the Son in order to have the Father. You can't just have the Father. The Son and God are one and the same. Therefore, because they didn't acknowledge Jesus, they did not know the true God, period. And it's the same today. If you do not know Jesus as God, you do not know the living God. And so Paul's heart is he says, I wish that I was accursed if it meant their salvation. Now, I have to admit, I can't say that I have that love for people, especially people that are wicked people as the Jews were. I mean, they killed Christians. They were out to slaughter Christians. And here Paul's response is, is I, if it meant if I were separated from God that they might be saved, I would do it. Moses had that same heart. The people wanted to kill Moses many times. They wanted to forsake Moses. And one time God said to Moses, Moses, step back, I'm going to wipe these people out. And Moses says, no, God, don't. These are your people. You have a covenant with them. And if you don't forgive, he's like, please forgive them. And if you don't forgive them, blot my name out of the book of life. Moses had the same prayer, the same heart for these people. Even though the people were wicked, he had a love for these people, so much so that he would even wish himself cursed, sentenced to eternal damnation for the sake of someone else. Guys, now, I have to say that that is not true. That really can't happen. You can't bear someone else's sin. Everyone is responsible for their own sin. So even though Paul would, or Moses, either one would be willing to do it, it, it doesn't work that way. Everyone is guilty for their own actions. However, this is a desire that proceeds from the very heart of God. This is God's love. We need to understand that because, see, God, his name is Jesus, suffered the judgment of God, and he was accursed from God. Remember when Jesus was dying on the cross? What were his last words? Well, besides it is finished, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, in the Aramaic, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? At the moment of Jesus' death, he was accursed from God. For who? For you. For your sake. He died and was separated, accursed from God for you. That's God's love for all humanity. And that was God's love displayed in Paul's heart and even in Moses' heart. And you know what? In my life, I've had moments where I have felt this love, but it's not for other people. <laughs> I remember when I was holding my son, and he had a temperature, I think it was about 105, 106. And babies can handle temperatures like that. Like if it was an older person, we'd be dead. If you have a 106 temperature, you can't survive. But nevertheless, when your baby has a 105, 106 temperature, it's not a pretty sight. I mean, just to feel the burning. <laughs> I said, I might not even start crying. But I was holding my son, and he was so hot, and he was just so miserable. And I remember praying at that moment, and the thoughts that were going through my head, like, is this going to be it? Am I going to lose my son? And then anything and everything in your heart to try to save him, you'd do anything. And then you realize that it's completely out of your hands. And I went and I said, God, please, heal my son. Don't let him go. And uh, I remember praying, God, if it's possible, 
take, I will take that sickness. I, I'll be my life to go instead of him. That is the love of God. But you see, God's love is not just for those who would be good. God's love is for the worst of sinners. You see, guys, that's why I have such great mercy on people who are addicted to drugs. And even though society might look at them and say that they're useless and they're worthless and there's no point for them, I have such a great love for them because I came from that. I understand what it's like, and I realize that people that are struggling in addiction aren't bad people. They just are struggling with a sin, and they need help. But guys, we can open this up, even to the worst of sinners. Let's say ISIS, people who are terrorists, who regard no, no, per, they don't regard life. They hate people. But if you try to think how a person in ISIS thinks, they are willing to strap a bomb to themselves and blow themselves up. Why? Because they think they're doing it for God. They're blind. Now, could you imagine your love saying, I wish that I was accursed from God if it meant that they could be saved? Not one person would say that. And what that means is, is that we are very far from the love of God. Because Jesus, Jesus was accursed for, the, for ISIS. He died for them. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that they shouldn't be stopped. I do believe that God would want them to be stopped by force. That is righteousness. But from the heart of God, through the death of his son, from a spiritual level, God wants them to be saved just the same as God wants everyone to be saved. He wants people to come to their senses because the reality is, is they don't know what they're doing. Jesus said that when they were killing him. They were killing Jesus. And as they were nailing him to the cross and as he was sitting there suffocating, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. What love. But love, God, help us to have that same love. But guys, this is where the confusion can happen. Should then we have justice system and should we have laws? Absolutely. If a person goes out and murders someone, they should face the judgment for that murder, even if it's the death penalty. That's right. That has nothing to do with Christianity. At the same point, we should hope and we should want that that person would be saved. And if that person gets saved, they still have to bear the judgment from their action but not for eternity if they're saved. I hope that makes sense to you. If, if a person is saved, they still have to face the consequences for their actions, and that's right. But they can be saved for all eternity because of their faith in Jesus Christ. Because if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And you know what's really sad is there are people that that, that makes them mad, that God would forgive a sinner, that God would forgive someone like Jeffrey Dahmer. That makes people mad. Oh, he should die. Well, he did die, but God could save him. And that should not make us angry. That should make us rejoice because if God can save a total heathen, that means that God can save me and God can save you because you know what? When it really comes down to it, you're a total heathen too. If you really look inside your heart honestly, you're not that great of a person. You have wicked thoughts too. And even though you might not have been in an opportunity to display them like others, I bear guarantee you would. Guys, I pray that God would give us a love like Paul had. That we would love people so much that we would do anything that they might be saved. And guys, I do think today and within the church that we are more concerned with the physical and we need to be more concerned with the spiritual. Really, when you come to church, I do not care what you've done in your flesh. I don't care what kind of a past you have. You could be do really horrific things. That doesn't bother me. I don't judge you by that. I don't care what you did yesterday. What I care is, is where you're at spiritually with the Lord today. Where are you at with God? Is God touching your heart? Is God, has he saved you? Has he rescued your heart? Have you come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? That's the most important thing. 
We need to not worry so much about the physical. Is it right for a Christian to watch TV? Is it right? Get your eyes on Jesus. If your eyes are on Jesus, everything else will fall into place. So going on, Paul goes on to say, these Israelites, to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises of whom the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Jesus Christ came, who is over all, he is the eternally blessed God, amen. And Paul is saying, these Israelites as a people group, as a race, they were very blessed. They were more blessed than any other nation group because God chose that nation to display the truth to the world. God gave them the law and the services of God. They had access through their sacrifices to worship the living God. And even on top of all that, Jesus came from that people group. To deny today that Israel as a nation does not stand out as a nation is to deny the obvious. There's even a word invented to describe the hatred of people, these people, anti-Semitism. They made a word to describe the hatred for these people. Is there a word to describe the hatred towards England, towards France, towards Australia? <laughs> no, the Jewish people stand out. Why? Because God has set that nation apart from all other nations, clearly. It's obvious that Israel, there's something special about Israel. We'll get to that in the future, not today. But notice that Paul calls Jesus God. He is the eternally blessed God. Not a God, but the God. And you see, God is one. It's called the Trinity. It's, it's, it's hard to imagine it, but here we have the sphere of God. Let's just say it's a sphere. And this sphere is made up of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they're three separate persons, but they're not separate so much that they are apart from each other. They are connected. They are make up the Godhead, we call it. It's God. You say, do you worship God? We say, yes. Who is God? He's the Father, He's the Son, and the Holy Spirit. These three make up God. And only God is worthy of worship and adoration. And you can worship God whether you're worshiping the Father, whether you're worshiping the Son, or even worship of the Holy Spirit and praising the name of the Holy Spirit, praising the name of Jesus, praising the name of the Father. You, in praising any one of them, you are praising God because they are perfect and one. And the worship of anything else is idolatry, of course. You say, well, what is the point of it? There's an order. God is a God of order, and there's instructions. How does it work? The Holy Spirit reveals Jesus. Jesus reveals the Father. And so as the Holy Spirit will come into your heart and reveal the Son in us, the Son, Jesus, then gives us access to, to the Father. And they work in such a harmonious, perfect way. It's really neat. But to deny any one of them is to deny God himself. If you deny the Holy Spirit, you're denying the very existence of God. If you deny that Jesus is the God, you're denying the very God himself. To say that Jesus was not God is to deny the very God himself. And there is a push even within Christianity today that they say that Islam and the Muslims believe in the same God as the Christians. No, they don't. That's, that's, that's an ignorant statement. To say, well, they believe in the God of the Old Testament. Oh, yeah. They believe in the same God as the Jews. Well, I actually maybe agree with that. They believe in the same God as the Christians. No, they don't. Why? Because the Islamic Muslims do not believe that Jesus is God. And because they do not believe that Jesus is God, they do not worship the same God as the church. Even though they're saying God, even though they're quoting from the Bible, it's not the same God. But you know what? Same is true for the Jew today. The Jew is not worshiping the same God as Christians because they do not acknowledge that Jesus is God. Therefore, they cannot worship the same God, even though they have the Old Testament. Remember, God is not a name. It's a, per it's a title to the person and the identity of Jesus. Jesus is God. And God, guys, even many Catholics do not believe in the true God. Because they acknowledge that Jesus is not the eternal God. They say he is a God, but in fact he is the mother, or excuse me, the son of Mary. That Mary is the mother of God. 
Mary is not the mother of God. Jesus created the world. Jesus was the voice that spoke the entire world into existence. You're going to tell me that Jesus had a mother? No. Jesus had no beginning. He existed from all eternity. And to say anything else is to deny who Jesus is and to deny the true God. And that does not come from me as it came from Thomas when he said, Jesus, show us the Father. And Jesus, Thomas, 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 you've been so long with me and you haven't seen me because you see, if you see me, you actually are looking at the Father. And John wrote about that in his epistle. He says, guys, you don't understand this. We handled him. We touched him. He talked with us. He laughed with us. It was the eternal God in the flesh. John understood that. All the disciples understood that. When they were talking with Jesus, he wasn't just another man. He was the God. That's the truth of the word of God, guys. But these Israelites, these Israelites were the chosen people. They were God's people and they were set apart. And then the question would be as well, if they were set apart and they were given the law, why weren't they saved? Why were the majority of the Jews not saved? If they were God's people, what's wrong? Well, going on, Paul addresses this question, but he says, it's not that the word of God has taken no effect. For they are not all Israel who are Israel, nor Are they all the children because they are of the seed of Abraham? But in Isaac, your seed shall be called. Now, what's Paul saying here? Paul is addressing, this guy's got to follow me here. Paul is addressing the spiritual Israel, those who have come to faith in Jesus. Remember what the word Israel means. Israel means governed by God. It's God's people. So the church, in a sense, are Israel. We are the spiritual house of God. We are God's people. We we are the spiritual Israel. But as we're going on, this does not mean that God is done with the nation of Israel. That's a whole other topic, and we'll get to that in the future, as I keep saying. (laughs) But the spiritual Israel is not made up of a certain race of people. The spiritual Israel is made up of all peoples. Anyone and everyone that places their faith in Jesus Christ is part of this spiritual Israel because it's faith in the very word of God. Jesus is the word of God. And these people are known as the church. The church is not a denomination. It's not an organization. It's not a business. It's not a building. The church are those who place their faith in Jesus Christ. Then you are part of the church, the spiritual house of God. And you don't need, it doesn't matter where you meet, it doesn't matter what you call it, if you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you are part of the church. It doesn't matter what you call it. You're part of the church. The spiritual house of God. Now Paul, being this excellent teacher that he is, is going to show using the word of God this truth. Because you see, he says, in Isaac your seed shall be. And why he's pointing to this is because he's saying Abraham had two sons. He had Ishmael and he had Isaac. And if it was just the descendants of Abraham that were to be of the house of God, then Ishmael would have just as much right to be in the house of God than Isaac. But no, Isaac was the chosen one. Isaac was, even though they both were of the seed of Abraham, Isaac was the one, not all were part of this covenant. But guys, remember, as Paul is making this switched over into a spiritual race, Paul is saying that it's not, you see this understanding of Israel, and and even though, in a sense, Ishmael and Isaac would have shared in common likeness to be of Israel because they both are with Abraham, only Isaac was. And the same is true in this seed. Really, the seed is Jesus himself. It's faith in this seed that makes a person part of the true Israel. Because you see, through Abraham's line, if you trace that all the way down, you would run into a person by the name of Mary. And Mary gave birth, or in her egg, she was conceived by the Holy Spirit. God himself implanted the genetic codes into Mary's egg, and she gave birth to Jesus on this earth. And he was, 
in the flesh from the line of Abraham, but he was the son of God. He was in the line of Abraham. But it wasn't necessarily all Israel that were to be of this house. It was just the chosen or those who had placed their faith. And and guys, I know this can be a little bit confusing. I hope it makes sense. But it wasn't a race that God was looking for. God wasn't looking for a race of people. God was looking for faith. It was always faith. You can't be born into the house of Israel in a spiritual sense as far as You know, I'm a Jew, so that means I'm part of the house of Israel and the spirit. No, it was you had to have faith. You had to be have faith be part of this people. And God told Abraham that he was going to be father of the holy people. He was going to be the father of many nations. He wasn't speaking of just the house of Israel as a nation. He was speaking of the spiritual house of God that Abraham was going to be the father of many nations, that the like faith of Abraham, Abraham believed that the Messiah was going to come through his line. And Abraham had faith, and just the same as anyone who has faith in the Son of God is part of this house of Israel. Because Abraham had two sons, only one was born in faith, the other one was a product of Abraham's works. Ishmael was a product of works. It was only faith that is accounted. Then going on, then the next argument is, is not only this, excuse me, verse 8, and that is those who are the children of the flesh, the Israelites or the Jews, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. The children of God or the true Israelite, God's chosen people, was something that was accomplished through this special seed of Abraham. And the seed was the Messiah, the promise of the Messiah. And guys, have you ever wondered how the Old Testament people were saved? Because Jesus didn't die on the cross yet. He wasn't even born yet. And so where was their faith at in the Old Testament? Their faith was in the Messiah as well. It's just they weren't looking back as we are looking back. They were looking forward. They were waiting for the promise of the Messiah. Where we in the New Testament or AD are looking back, but the same person in the Messiah. And so it was a faith that makes us part of this spiritual house. In verse 10, it says, and not only this, but when Rebecca, Rebecca was Isaac's wife when she had conceived by one man even our father isaac for the children not being born nor having done any good or evil that the purpose of god according to election might stand not of works but of him who calls it was said to her the older shall serve the younger as it is written jacob i have loved but esau i have hated because isaac had two sons You could say, well, both of them were of the seed of David. Both are Israelites. No, only one was. God chose Isaac, not Esau. Excuse me, (laughs) Jacob, not Esau. The promise of election, meaning that you could say that it was the word of God. God chose one, not the other. And the whole point of this argument that Paul is making is, and we need to understand the point, Just because you have a Jewish heritage does not make you a true Israelite or God's people. Don't trust your heritage. You need to trust in the person of Jesus Christ. You have to have faith. Because you see, Abraham had two sons, but one was of the promise. It wasn't all the Jewish line that were of the promise. Because some Jews thought just because they were a Jew that that meant they were saved. No, a Jew could not save you. Being a Jew could not mean that you were saved. You had to be of the line of faith is the whole point. And guys, it was faith in the promise of God's word. Faith in what God has said. And guys, this is so true for those and it's also true for us. If we place our faith in what God has said in his word, that makes us part of this spiritual house. You can deny that. You can say, I don't believe what God has said. Then you're not part of this house. But if you put your faith in what Jesus has said and what the Bible has said, that makes you a child. 
And when you look at the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and you look at their lives, they were not perfect by a long shot. They made a lot of mistakes. But one thing that those three men had in common was their faith. They all believed in God, the true God. But notice it says in verse 12, the older shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I have loved and Esau I have hated. And what he's getting into here is the sovereignty of God. Because going back to the story, when Rebecca conceived and she was pregnant, her stomach was turning. And it was turning every day. And she's like, what's going on in me? And so she inquired of God. She says, God, what's going on in my stomach? And he says, you have two nations in your womb. You have twins. And then he said, the older shall serve the younger. Now, could you imagine the anticipation of them coming out? It's like, which one's going to come first? <laughs> Esau was the older. Jacob was the younger. And the older was going to serve the younger. Now, before we get into this idea of election and God's choosing, we need to understand this point. Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated. In our mind, we think like, well, does God actually hate people? That's actually a poor translation. It really says, Jacob I have loved, Esau I have loved less. It's not a word of hatred. It's basically, it's pointing that Jacob was chosen, Esau was not. Jacob was the one who would be of the promise, not Esau. Now, if you think that that means that God made it impossible for Esau to be a child of God, you're wrong. God did not make it, basically said, okay, Esau, you're cursed from the time that you're born. There is no way possible that you're going to come to faith or believe in me. And even if you try, I'm going to make it so you don't. So you can't be saved. Guys, God never excludes anyone. Jesus said, anyone who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. Jesus says, whoever believes in him will be saved. The Bible says, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Even in the Old Testament, Joshua says, choose this day who you will serve. As for me and my house, we choose the Lord. The whole counsel of God says that you have a choice. And so to say that this means that Esau did not have a choice is to deny the whole counsel of God. And the reason why I bring this up is there's a branch in Christianity called Calvinism. And I know it's a huge topic and I don't have time to go through the five points today. And there's variations in Calvinism and what they believe. But basically, the foundation of Calvinism is that God chose some to be his people and God chose the rest to be destroyed. That's the foundation. God chose his elect, his people, and God chose those who were going to be destroyed. Just like God chose Jacob and God didn't choose Esau. This is their foundation right here. And then they will continue in the idea, of one of their points is called irresistible grace. Meaning that if God chose you to be saved, you can't say no. You don't have a choice in it. So if you're chosen, you can go out and live however you want to live because really in the end, you're going to come back. Because it's irresistible grace. You can't resist it. So you're chosen. Guys, To say that Jacob did not have a choice and that all that Jacob did was ordered by God is, is silly because, guys, that view of Calvinism right there, if you hold that view, I, I, just, I say this respectfully, but you're wrong. That's not right. That's not what the Bible teaches because that goes against many other scriptures. You can't say that's a truth. If your doctrine contradicts other scripture, then your doctrine is wrong. If your church doctrine contradicts other scriptures, then your doctrine is wrong. To say that people don't have a choice and that God just makes people go to hell, that's the most horrible thing ever. That, that would make God, who cares what it, what it makes? It just goes against what God says. Anyone and everyone that believes in him will be saved. All who come to me, I will by no means cast out. That opens the door to everyone. 
To say that that closes the door is to misinterpret the word of God. And they really are using this context right here, the people who believe that. There's a couple other parts, but obviously in every section they take it out of context. Context, context. Paul is showing that the promise is not of the flesh. The promise of being the spiritual house of Israel. The promise is from God. Faith in the promises. Because you see... Paul just spent the previous eight chapters teaching what? Everyone is a sinner, and if we place our faith in Jesus Christ, we become righteous. He just spent eight chapters teaching about that. And then all of a sudden in chapter nine, what's he doing? Throwing that all out? And say, well, forget all that. Really, you don't have any choice in it. You don't have any matter in it, because if either you're chosen or you're not. Guys, that doesn't make any sense then why would God say, Jacob, I have chosen? Why would God say that if he didn't really mean that or if he didn't do it? Because, again, God knows everything. He knew exactly what Jacob was going to do before he did it. But to say that Jacob, or excuse me, to say that God made Jacob do it is silly because Jacob was a sinner. Jacob had four wives. Jacob was a liar. Jacob was a cheater. Did God make him do those things? No. And you read the story of Jacob, what what happened in his life? He was on the run. He was running for his very life. And he fell asleep and laid on a rock. He had a dream. And in that dream, he saw this ladder. And when he woke up from this dream, he made a choice and he surrendered his life to God. And at that moment of surrender, he was of the promise. Now, just because God spoke of that day before it ever happened does not mean that God made that day happen. He made his own choice. But God just foresaw it. And guys, we can't so hard to wrap your mind around this because we don't see things like this. I'll get to that in a second. But just on the other side of it, did Esau not have a choice? That Esau was just destined to be a sinner? Let me read something to you. It's actually found in Hebrews. He said, Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up may cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Many fall away from the faith because they become bitter in their Christianity. But then he says, lest any be like the fornicator or profane person like Esau, poor Esau, listen, whom for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. And you're like, that poor Esau. He tried to repent, and he was trying to weep, over it to try to repent. No, you're, you're reading it wrong. He found no place for repentance. Period. He was weeping over the loss of his money. What was he seeking diligently for? He wanted the birthright. He wanted the money because the birthright meant that he would get the inheritance. Esau could have repented. Esau did not repent. That was his choice. God knew that that was going to be his choice even before he made the choice because God knows everything. There's a scene in the movie The Matrix. I don't know if you've seen that movie. But I just want to point this out because it's a way to kind of understand this. But Neo was supposed to go see this oracle. And this oracle was basically someone who knew the future, who could see everything in the future. And so... When Nia went to her and he talked with her, she turned to him and he says, don't worry about that vase. And as soon as she said that, Neo turned and said, what vase? And as he turned, he knocked over the vase and it broke on the ground. And she's like, um, Neo's just like, oh, he's like, yeah. He realized that she saw the future. He said, what's really going to kill you is, if I didn't say anything, would you have still broken the vase? And then to try to really, if you try to imagine that, I mean, God knows everything and there's nothing that you can do to change the outcome because God already knows what you're going to do. For instance, 
If you went in your mind and said, you know what, I'm just going to run and dive out to the middle of the road and I'm going to get run over by a car. Well, God already knew you were going to do that even before you ever did that. Well, what if I didn't? What if I just didn't want to do that? Well, God already knew that. So can I do something that would ever surprise God? Anything and everything you do, no matter how many mind games you play on yourself, God already knows you're going to do that. Because you see, this knowledge is so beyond our knowledge, we really can't understand this, guys. But the point is, is that as a church, as a person, you have a choice. You can choose to serve the Lord, and once you choose to serve the Lord, you will find out that you were always chosen. That God selected you before the beginning of the world. And if you choose not to serve the Lord, then he always knew that you were chosen. The choice is yours. But God already knows the choice you're going to make. And so he says to me, Charlie, I called you before the foundation of the world. I knew you by name while you were still in the matrix. And he used that word, the English, old English used that word in the... um, Psalms, while you were still nothing, I called you. And he can say the same for you. You say, how does God make that decision? How can God know that? Because God knows everything. And he knows what you're going to do. But you just the same if you say, well, I don't want to serve God. I don't want to surrender to God. Well, God already knew that. He always knew that. But the choice is yours. That's why no one was going to be able to say, God, that's not fair. That's not fair, God. That's not fair that they had to be punished. Yeah, it is. Because God has given everyone free will. He's given you the ability to choose. And what an awesome responsibility that is. And guys, I say this so many times to so many different people. We love the ability to choose, and we choose what we're going to do every single day. I mean, just even coming to church this morning was your choice. And then as we leave church, you guys are going to choose what you're going to do this day. And we really always choose things that make us happy. We choose things that we find pleasure in. And that's okay. That's our choice. But we have to remember the truth behind it, that there's a whole spiritual world. And there is the very truth of God's word. And people, I find it so amazing, are putting their faith and trust in something that they don't even want to look into. That they don't even want to find out the truth. When I talk with people of different religion and I begin to question their religion, they say, don't, stop attacking me. I'm like, I'm not attacking, I'm just questioning. What's wrong with questioning? We don't question. Any religion or any Christianity that says that you're not supposed to question, get out of that thing. God says, test all things. Question all things. We are to question. Why do you believe what you believe? Why do you hold fast to what you know? Are you going to go to heaven? Do you think so? Why do you believe that? Why do you think that you're going to go to heaven? Well, because fill in the blank. Why do you believe that? What faith, what proof do you have that believing this way is going to get you to heaven? Now, to a Christian, we, just, we don't want to question that. But let's say it's um, an ISIS person. Why do you think blowing up yourself and killing innocent people is going to send you to heaven? Why do you believe that? Who told you that? Some guy told me that. Well, don't you want to question that? Doesn't that seem weird? Wouldn't you question? We don't question I just believe in all my heart that the moment that I blow myself up, I'm going to heaven. He believed that. Why do they believe that? They were told that. Guys, I'm telling you, you have a responsibility before God to know the truth. That is your responsibility. And you're not going to be able to go up in that day and say, God, I didn't know. That's not God's fault. That's your fault. You didn't look into it. You know what's really sad? Is when I talk to Christians and I begin to express eternity and the moment that I die, I get to go to heaven 
And this person turned to me and said, you can only hope. We don't really know for sure. And I said, boy, if a Christian does not know where they're going when they die, it's very sad and very tragic because that means that their faith is not real. Because you see, guys, as the church, I am 100% sure of what the Bible teaches me because I believe that this is the very word of God. And I know what the Bible teaches. I know what it says. And I am 100% certain of it. And even though people might, I say, please attack me. Question me. Why do I believe what I believe? Ask me. And I will tell you why I believe that. Because I know it's in the word of God. And I've studied the word of God. But for someone not to study the word of God and have a whole belief system based upon the teachings of man, that's very sad and very tragic. And we're going to get into this a little bit more next week about God's election, God's choosing. But see, the whole point of what Paul is saying here about election is, is that you can't save yourself. You don't have it in you to save yourself. You can't say today, I'm a sinner, I need to do something about it. Okay, I'm going to stop sinning today. It doesn't help you. You can't save yourself. Only God can save you. It's a work of God in your heart, in your life. But our choice is what we believe. I love this one word, or excuse me, one phrase. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That is your choice. Are you going to call out to God? Or are you going to trust some theologian or some ideals or some conviction that you just learned from some person? Or are you going to call out to the Lord and be saved? Bible says whoever calls out to the name of Jesus will be saved. That's the truth. Whoever. But guys, again, this false idea from this section are is the church replacing Israel. And it might seem like that. That, you know, he's talking about the spiritual Israel. It might seem that God has now replaced Israel as a nation with the church. And even from the very church, there has been so much anti-Semitism. Luther himself hated the Jews. That's why it was so easy for Hitler to do what he did. Luther was from Germany. Luther's disciples hated the Jews. And there was a huge push against them. That's that's history. Even from the church, there's been a hatred for Jews. Guys, the Jews are God's nation. And we can't forget that. In, In chapter 11, we'll get into that idea a little bit more. But also, guys, eternal security, not eternal security, God's election, God's choosing. Both of these ideas are not supported in the whole teaching of God's word. So it's important that we know the entire Bible front to cover in knowing the purposes of God. That's that's your responsibility, guys, to know the Bible and to know what God has said. And I, as a pastor of Calvary Chapel, I do my best to teach you the word of God, and I'm presenting to you the truth of God's word because I want you to be informed. I want you to know the truth. And look into these things yourself. Study them out, and they are all there. And I do not pretend to have a higher knowledge than people. It's not like I'm through reasoning and through prayer and I just asked God for wisdom and God gave me the truth in a life. Now that's not what happened. I studied the word. And I studied the word. And I studied the word. Most Christians have not even read the Bible front to cover. Read the word of God. And you say, well, it's hard. Yeah, I understand that. But go through it with a pastor. Have someone teach you verse by verse through the Bible. And if you say, well, what pastor was good to do that? Any pastor through history that study the word of God verse by verse has been a great pastor, really. Matthew Henry, um, J. Vernon McGee, they're not Calvary Chapel. They just dedicated themselves to studying the word of God. They're very good Bible teachers. If you just study what the Bible says, you're going to find yourself in a good place. Let's pray.